It's World Times Media. I'm your digital anchor, Andre Ash, and we've got a special guest joining us today. And I'm joined also by my colleague from Atlanta Daily World Executive Editor, A.R. Shaw. Yeah, it's great to be here. I got an opportunity to, to cover multiple events during your tenure at BET. Wow. So I'm excited for this interview. Absolutely. And yeah, she has been the CEO of BET for over a decade. And now she's out with a brand new memoir title, I Am Deborah Lee. She joins us right here, right now from Studio 1452. Good to have you join us. Great. Thank you. I'm, I'm honored to be here. Absolutely. Uh, Detroit is one of my favorite cities and I don't get here enough. Yes. So I'm glad to be here this weekend and glad to meet both of you and yeah. um, glad to be at your brand new studio absolutely it's beautiful well, yeah we, we appreciate it well it, it is great to have you it's an honor to have you join us so let's get straight to it uh let's get into the book i am okay. Deborah Lee. Uh, you know what does the book entail um you know why did you decide to write it and why not i stepped down from bet four years ago i was ceo for 13 years i was coo for 10 years uh, and I was general counsel before that. Uh, so I had an amazing 32-year career at yeah. BET. Um, and when I stepped down, I looked around and realized there still were very few black female CEOs. Very few fe female CEOs in general, but black female CEOs uh, even more so. And it made me think about why... We, in particular, are having such a hard time mm -hmm. in the corporate world and, and raising, climbing the ladder and getting to CEO. And then I, I decided with the end of my career at BET that that was a good time to, to tell that story and end with me leaving. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've, I've been very busy since I left. I'm yeah. on four corporate boards. Um, and uh, started a company to help people of color get on boards, and I have a, a, a women's foundation. So it's not like I stopped. Yeah. You know, I've still been building. I've still been um, 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 purposeful about what I do, and I just thought it was time and a good idea to write a story, write my story, mm -hmm. and hopefully in inspire young girls and boys yeah. to dream big, to go after what they want, to realize you still have challenges. Everyone has challenges. You may not see them, mm -hmm. uh, but you can still be successful yeah. and don't give up. Gotcha. And so that's the story I wanted to tell. Gotcha. And I wanted to do a business advice book, but I wanted to do it through my experiences yeah. in my life. Yeah. So there, there was so much innovation during your tenure at BET, from original programming like Being Mary Jane to 106 in Park and the BET Awards. Can you discuss that era at BET and some of those groundbreaking moments? Uh, well, it we were getting demands from our audience to um, uh, to have more original programming. You know, our audience never saw the difference between BET and ABC and CBS. They're like, well, why aren't you like them? You know, and they didn't understand that we didn't have the budget for original programming. So when I took over as CEO and people started asking me my vision, mm. um, I said it's to do more original programming. And by that time, we had been acquired by Viacom. We had more resources. And I just felt like we were never going to be taken seriously as a network unless we did original programming. Now, other cable networks like USA Network, they built their whole network on reruns. But when we put reruns on, people were like, oh, there's that BET again putting mm -hmm. on reruns. I said, well, it's really called syndicated programming. <laughs> and mm -hmm. a lot of networks make their living off of that. Um, so, but I started, uh, I built a team that was um, accustomed to doing original programming, and we started trying to build that skill set. And the first thing we did, well, we did a few reality shows. You may remember Keisha Cole, yeah. and her mother Frankie, and bless her heart. Yeah. And um, some of those worked, but the first scripted show we put on the air that worked was The Game. Yeah. 
And we took that over uh, from CBS. CBS was producing that show. It was aired on the CW. On the CW, it got like a million, five viewers. They never promoted it. Uh, but people loved it. And when the CW canceled it, there was a letter writing email campaign to me for BET to pick it up. Yeah. And we had already started showing the uh, re-airs of the shows. And so we knew our audience loved it. So the show had been off the air for about two years. And uh, we finally convinced CBS to trust us. Mm -hmm. They didn't think we could keep up the production quality. Go figure. And, but the uh, show had been around for so many years afterwards. Right. And we uh, hired the same team. Yes. You know, the writers, the actors, it was the same team. So why they thought we were going to do uh, a quality, uh, less quality show. But anyway, we put it on the air. Uh, there was a Facebook campaign. Uh, Facebook was really big at the time. You know, everyone put this up on your Facebook page. Don't bother me. I'm watching the game. <laughs> and we didn't have a lot of money for marketing, but that Facebook campaign really helped us. Yeah. And that night we got 7.7 .7 million views, wow. which is still a record mm -hmm. in the um Cable World, mm -hmm. highest premiere of a sitcom ever. Um, so that emboldened us. <laughs> I got flowers from Tyler Perry. Yeah. I got a call, call from uh, Jonathan uh, Rogers, John Rogers, who was running um, um, TV One. Mm -hmm. And the, everyone agreed that it proved the case. If you gave uh, black people high quality programming, mm -hmm. authentic they would show up. Yeah. And so we went from the game to uh, Be a Mary Jane, uh, to New Edition Story, to you mentioned BET Awards. We put more money into those, put more um, community organization service awards within the music awards. Uh, you know, we wanted, it, we, we wanted all our programming to have a, a purpose. That was my goal and my vision and our brand strategy to was to respect reflect and uplift um our audience yeah. and if programming didn't do that we didn't want to do it yeah. and so um the original programming proved that we could do that and then i created shows like bt honors uh we uh did black girls rock uh, and everything was was working great. Our ratings went up. Yeah. Uh, our competitors uh, were concerned, uh, and that was the time we would start having a lot more competitors. Mm -hmm. You know, TV One, uh, Tyler's Perry programming was on Turner Networks. Oprah uh, went yeah, black, was on, so. <laughs> which I never thought she would do, yeah. but she found that black programming was working for her. Um, um, each, a lot of the other cable networks had black nights, like VH1 had Monday night mm -hmm. and, and We TV or Bravo had real housewives of, you know, every city you can think of. But Atlanta was their most popular. So we had real uh, competition. We weren't the only network servicing the black community. So we, I was ready to compete. Yeah. So as long as I had the resources and I could hire talented people, um, and it was, it was really working. And people noticed. People still come up to me on the street, especially young black men, and say, thank you, Miss Lee, wow. for what you did for the culture. And that just warms my heart. And I was talking to someone yesterday. Uh, I was being interviewed, and they were like, you know, Miss Lee, you don't really understand what you did for the hip-hop community. And I think giving black men that platform, mm -hmm. working with them <laughs> to uh, edit the videos yeah. and have them presentable. You know, I had to send one of my lawyers down to the BET Awards to look at all the costumes for the background singers. Because yeah. I, my view was I don't mind them being sexy, but I don't want them being slutty. You know, and there's a thin line between that. And you made that executive call. <laughs> I made that executive call. I said, I don't want them looking like, you know, pole dancers or, or uh, prostitutes. They should look like professional dancers. But they can be sexy. Yeah. And, uh, so, you heard it here from right, right. <laughs> So that worked uh, for a while. I don't know if you know, I had protesters outside my house for about seven months. 
because a young minister uh, in Maryland didn't like three videos. Um, and, you know, I became the focal point mm -hmm. of criticism of hip hop videos, which I thought was unfair. Mm -hmm. I mean, we really work hard with the uh, labels uh, to get them to the point where we could air them. We had a standards uh, committee made up of different folks from BET, young people, older people, different departments. Uh, and we put a lot of time and effort into it. So when the protesters came to my house, I was like, why didn't they go to Ludacris' house? Oh, yeah. Nelly's house. How about him? He, he, he created quite a bit of controversy himself. Yeah. Um, and uh, none of them came to my defense. And so I said, mm. well, my, if I'm going to be the face of hip hop uh, and for the criticism, I'm going to institute my standards and I'm going to be the final decision maker. Mm. And that's what I became. Yeah. That's not what I went to law school to do, but that's what I became. Mm. And the first time I rejected a Kanye video, uh, it was flashing lights. There's a little bit of almost nudity, a lot of violence. And I looked at the video, I said, you know, there's no social value here mm. and I'm not going to put it on the air. And uh, my people went crazy. They were like, well, you know, Kanye is a genius and he's going to be mad and he's going to call you. And I was like, you know what? I survived. Seven months of protesters at my yeah. house. I can take a I call. I can get through this. I can take a call <laughs> from Kanye. Mm. And he, the funny part, he never called. Mm. He just went with the decision. And, you know, MTV played it great. It was online. And, you know, I find, I'm a lawyer by yeah. training. And I finally realized that I was trying to protect the First Amendment rights of artists. Mm. And I, I still think that's very important. Yeah. But that did not mean I had to put their videos on BET. No. They had other outlets. You know, New York Times, firm believer in um, freedom of speech, they don't put everything in their newspaper. They make editorial decisions. Mm -hmm. And so I started making editorial decisions. And, um, you know, I, I, I felt better about it. And, you know, we had, well, black community is very conservative. Mm -hmm. You know, it's parts of it. Um, and they don't mind partying at night, but they go to church on Sunday and they don't want to, um, they look to BET mm. to protect the race. Mm. And that was, a sometimes a burden, uh, but it, when we got it right, they showed up yeah. in droves and that was very rewarding. You know, when you talk about innovative programming uh, at BET, you know, even the existence of how black media began, it was for the purpose of elevating the voices and stories and issues of the black community right. that didn't always have uh, the attention or spotlight in mm -hmm. mainstream media. So when you, when you think about black media, uh, how do you, what do you see as the future of black media in, in this landscape where we are right now? Right. Uh, and, and even the future of BET. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, black media is, is, is very important. Uh, I grew up on Soul Train, uh, one hour a week yeah. in Greensboro, North Carolina. And that's how I learned to dance, mm. dress, um, you know, who the hardest artists were. You're going to dance for us? No. <laughs> <laughs> I was never very good at learning those dances. <laughs> but, um, you know, we, we need... Um, um, representations that we can look up to. And our young people need that. You know, it's true what they say, you can't be it if you don't see it. Yeah. And we have good representation in music and sports, but there's so many other areas you don't see on, on TV. And over time, there's become more black programming, especially in the last, I would say, uh, four to five years. Yeah. On, me, on streaming networks, on um yeah every, you know there's a streaming outlet for right. every program now right things. right it's a it's a great time to be a creative yeah. uh for black media uh but it's got to continue and it's got to be authentic mm -hmm. and i'm afraid some of the reality shows some of some of even the scripted shows are not authentic they mm -hmm. show uh continue to show our um 
a community in a negative light. Mm -hmm. You know, you say we don't, we're not on the news. Well, we're on the news, but it's about murders and us being murdered and us murdering each other. And it's not always in a uh, positive light. Yeah. And so I think it's important. I hope BET continues to do that. You know, it's up for sale. Yeah. So I mean, there, there were the time. public reports uh, that uh, Byron Allen, Tyler Perry, uh, and others were interested. Did he? It, uh, P. Diddy, that's Diddy. right. Yeah. Uh, so, what do you think about that? You have any uh, plans on? Uh, you have any plans of going back to BT to help I, in any type of way? I don't. Uh, a couple of people called me and asked me, was I interested in okay. buying it? Uh, I thought about it for you know maybe fifteen minutes, 15 minutes. <laughs> and then um, you know I'm like, no, I, I'm I've moved on, mm. and uh, I think it's a great uh, network and it's grown into. Uh, great multiple networks, BET Her, uh, BET Plus, yeah. uh, but I wasn't ready to, yeah. to return. Uh, and I don't have a favorite in the fight, you know, I, yeah. I hope uh, uh, it works out great. Uh, Tyler's been doing a lot of programming uh, for BET, yeah. uh, and he has a very faithful audience. Um, so I, I like being on the sideline watching. Yeah. Uh, but I think the future of uh, black media is very important. I'm glad there are outlets like like yours, uh, digital, you know, it's not, it doesn't all have to be on network TV. In fact, the ratings on network TV are going down. Yeah. The network is watching streaming. Streaming, yeah. yeah. Cable is suffering. Um, so, you know, it's a real question of how long cable networks will be around. And uh, some streaming services are doing a really good job with black programming. Mm. Um, one I have to mention is Netflix, because I saw some of their data the other day uh, and you know they have a high percentage of uh, black uh, programming and programming directed by black people uh, but you need our voice in it mm. and we need to still be involved and I would like to see the ownership mm. still be there mm. I mean if anyone's gonna profit off of uh, black media you know I'd like to see it be black folks mm. um, so I think it's it's important for the future and um, and I, I like seeing you know Latino community um, demanding more programming the Asian community you know when crazy rich Asians came out you know everybody was surprised yeah. oh my god it did well well you all haven't done any programming for Asians mm. since Joy Luck Club that was 20 some years ago yeah. um, so it really bothers me that uh, network heads and, and uh, programming directors don't see the benefit mm. of a diverse world um, that's what we all should want absolutely they are I want to kind of go back for a minute. You you mentioned that uh, you want to inspire the next black women in media. Um, currently, there's still uh, low numbers in terms of black CEOs when it comes to uh, women, women in, in terms right. of representation in media. Just your thoughts on that. And also, uh, on the other hand, we have, you know, social media out, outlets like uh, the Shade Room and the Jasmine brand. They're owned by women, but they may not get the same attention. I just want to get your thoughts on those two uh, aspects of uh, of media. What can be done to increase the number of Black women CEOs and also uh, younger women who are, right. who are creating? Well, I platform. think the digital world does present a lot of different platforms uh, for Black women, uh, and it's great to see them uh, be successful. Like Issa Rae started uh, Awkward Black Girl and went from there to uh, Insecure. Uh, and she owns her own company, production company. She has a, a talent agency now. She owns four coffee shops in uh, L.A. called The Hilltop. And she's just doing different things. And that's so exciting to see. Mm -hmm. And I think young women need to know, uh, black women, that they can do it. And that's another reason I wrote the book, I Am Deborah Lee. I wanted them to hear my story and see how I did it and see that you can even have challenges along the way and still be successful. And I think the more uh, those of us who have been successful tell our story, uh, the more inspiration it'll be for, for young black women. And that's why I say dream big. I mean, I never thought of being a CEO when I was 
uh, a young girl. You know, I wanted to be a journalist or, you know, for a while I wanted to be Diana Ross. <laughs> then, then I wanted to be a fashion designer. Uh, but the thought of owning something really never occurred to me. But now I want to spread that word that it is possible. We should be about ownership. And after George Floyd's uh, murder that we all saw on video and we all saw the nonchalant look on that policeman's face as he sat there and murdered George Floyd in front of us. I think creating black wealth is one of the ways to combat that kind of um, uh, hatred, you know, and the way I decided to help was to start Monarchs Collective, which is a, a group, uh, um, a company to put more black people and women on boards because you can truly create wealth mm. on boards mm. and our community doesn't know that because our parents didn't do it mm. the white folks never let us into the club and now uh, after George Floyd's murder there was a lot of talk about companies that were giving lots of money to Black Lives Matter, but didn't have any black people on their board. Yeah. And younger people were like, "What? what's the deal? Mm -hmm. You know, how can you support Black Lives Matter and you look at your board and you don't have any people of color? So companies were scurrying, you know, to find um, black directors. And I hate to say, I think it's, it's calming down a little bit now, but we need to keep pushing that. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I want to see more black women um, as CEOs. I'd love to hear Kathy Hughes' story. Yeah. I, I mean, you know, George, uh, not, uh, Steven Spielberg said at the Golden Globes when he was accepting an award about Fable Men's, which is his life story, yeah. he said, no one knows your story until you tell it. Mm. And that's true. I mean, people see you. People can admire you. You know, people, young women think I've had a very glamorous life, and I have. But it also took a lot of hard work. I went to law school, you know, I negotiated Donnie Simpson's uh, contract for years and Bobby Jones. And, um, you had quite the journey. Yeah, yeah, had quite the journey, and but I've had uh, challenges mm -hmm. too. Uh, I talk about it, the fact that I had an abortion uh, between college and law school. And, um, you know, I had to make that decision. And at that time, it was three years after Roe v. Wade, I had the ability to make that decision. Mm -hmm. And now I see that decision being taken away mm -hmm. from women. Yeah. Uh, they can't control their own bodies and their own future. So I wanted to talk about that. Um, you know, I had issues managing men. Uh, I had to learn my management style and, you know, how to really get a team to support me. Because when I uh, first became COO, I inherited a team from Bob Johnson and they weren't all invested in my success. Um, and, um, you know, I started going on corporate boards and that was a lot of work, but a good learning experience. And then I talk about my relationship with Bob Johnson, yeah. uh, which for a long time was mentor, mentee. And then it turned into a personal relationship, which turned into, you know, um, abusive relationship and harassment. And all of a sudden, my career was tied to my relationship with Bob, yeah. um, which, you know, was talked about a lot in Me Too and Time's Up. But... In those circumstances, it was a more extreme circumstance. I mean, you know, the facts were more extreme. Yeah. Yeah, um, uh, women coming to the door and men in robes. and So that wasn't my experience, but it was still a difficult experience and something I had to deal with. You, you talk about uh, earlier the, the challenges mm -hmm. and, and, you know, in your journey. And so to that point, when you talk about or think about the power dynamics in the workplace, oh, yeah. uh, you know, you, in you telling your story, do you find comfort in the whole Me Too era that, you know what, this is time for me to tell my story, be right. inspiration to other uh, young women who are coming up in, 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 in even in black media? Right. It um, definitely gave me confidence and strength. There was a little bit of PSDT attached to it. You know, I was like, oh, my God, this is what I went through. Because there wasn't a name for it when I went through it. And there wasn't. And who do you talk to? And who do you talk to? You know, I was the general counsel. 
<laughs> I was, you know, we didn't even have a HR person. Um, and so, yeah, that was definitely part of what I wanted to do. I wanted people to know there are different kind of relationships. Anytime you're in a relationship with someone you report to, there's a power dynamic, whether it's used or not. Um, and you have to be aware of that. And I think more women are coming forward, and even men who find themselves in a different, difficult situation. You see what happened at Comcast this week, where the head yeah. of Comcast had to step down. To step down. The you know, head of CNN had to step down. I mean, there's still, you know, they're always going to be, maybe not always, but it's, imp it's hard to stop office romances because people work together long hours and uh, travel together and, and blah, blah, blah. But, uh, you know, Companies should um, definitely investigate when uh, allegations are brought forward, and women should be taken seriously. And even after Time's Up, we mm -hmm. saw a period of time where especially black women were not believed. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the Russell Simmons story almost didn't get told because... Um, you know, that people didn't want that documentary to be seen. Uh, and, and I'm not saying all allegations are true. And, um, you know, men and, and women do deserve defenses. Um, um, and, um, uh, you know, someone to look into the allegations. But it, at least it's being talked about. Yeah. And at least now we can talk to our daughters. You know, if this ever happens to you, you know, this is what you should do. Yeah. And you, you talked know. about going through therapy to get through oh, yeah. these trying times. Yeah. You still go through therapy. I, I know, do. You know, even after the loss of your son yeah. and, you know, uh, a trying time. But right. therapy is what got you through. You right. Know, you and I talk about that because there's so many black people who don't believe in therapy. And I think uh, when a friend of mine suggested that she could see I was having a tough time, even though I thought I was putting on a pretty good face. Um, and she suggested I go talk to someone. And, and that's really what saved me. Um, and the first uh, therapist I went to, and I was telling her about my, this relationship, and she said, you know, this has been happening for years. She said I was uh, went to a graduate school and there was a professor, and every year he had a different research assistant, and every year was a woman, mm -hmm. and every year he had a relationship with wow. her. And when the year was over, he moved on to someone else. And I was like, oh my God, I've never heard anything like that. So, you know, that really helped me a lot. And you mentioned my son, who I miss every day. He was uh, 31 years old. He was a DJ and an A&R guy, loved music, and... Um, um, he had a hard time dealing with Black Lives Matter and George Floyd's death and COVID, the isolation of COVID. So he died of depression. And uh, it was made me even uh, uh, more believer in therapy. I mean, knowing him, you would never think he was depressed. Mm -hmm. People loved him. He was always inclusive. You know, he always was the one giving parties. And... Um, you know, we just missed it somehow. Yeah. We didn't know. Um, so that really broke my heart and something that's really hard to deal with. Yeah. And I love black people. I love young black men. And uh, I have a daughter um, who's 29 now. Uh, and she's doing well. She writes for Abbott Elementary, which I'm really proud of. The show such we all love. That's such culture. a great, yeah, it's such a great show. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, especially COVID, um, um, made the need for for more therapy. Mm -hmm. And I hope more people do it. And a lot of things in the Black community, we have such generational trauma mm -hmm. that I had never heard of before. So, you know, our young people could actually be suffering from that, whatever their parents went through or their grand grandparents went through. Um, so it's something that um, we should look at more closely. We're going to wrap up soon, but um, AR, you got to follow. Yeah, just your advice on balance, on having balance. Uh, of course, we in a generation where it's like, you know, work hard, grind. Uh, always stay motivated, uh, continue, don't, you know, don't sleep. Uh, we're in that generation. But uh, on the flip side, we need, you know, rest. Right. We need to uh, rejuvenate. Can you give advice to that next generation on how to balance 
uh, work and inspiration right. and also maintain self-care. I think you, you said the magic word, self-care. Uh, it's so important, whatever you do to, you know, take your mind away from uh, work or family issues or whatever, uh, you need to make time for that. And again, now that a lot of us work at home, you know, it's even harder you know, you don't leave work even if you're leaving at 7 or 8 o'clock. You know, at 10 o'clock, you're still reading emails. Uh, you may be watching the game, but you're still working, you know. So we have to find mental breaks mm. and take care of our physical health with exercise and eating right and also our mental health. And our mental health suffered so much during COVID, and we have to learn how to take care of that. And balance is an impossible thing. There's never a balance. I look at it like a seesaw. You know, either work is up because you're really busy at work or home life is up because, you know, you got issues at home and have children and you're married. Um, you know, that can be, be stressful. So you just have to find a way to relax and not through alcohol or drugs or some of the, the wrong things uh, young people turn to, but just in terms of leading a healthy lifestyle and getting away from the stresses. And, I, you know, I'm probably the worst person to talk to about it because, you know, BET was such an integral part of my life. It was hard to leave uh, at all. And uh, I brought those, um, the good parts and the bad parts home sometime. Um, but it, it really is uh, uh, critical. And, you know, people have told me uh, since the passing of my son that young people especially take on not only their own problems, but the problems of the world. You know, climate change, uh, the war in Ukraine, what's happening in the Sudan. You know, young people really want to be um, changers yeah. and, and solve problems. Yeah. And so they take on the problems of the world. Yeah. Uh, and we have to tell them that's not the right way. It's, it's great to be passionate. It's great to give back. But, you know, they're not going to change climate change change the climate by themselves you know it's it's got to be you know organizations the government world groups um but social media i think is uh, is one of the uh bad parts of our life sometimes i mean it's good because you can keep in touch and you can laugh and you send memes and but it's also brings the problems of the world into our homes. Um, and, and, and how this young generation, how they get their news and who they look to for the news has also um, changed quite right. dramatically as well. And so as we wrap up briefly, this also happened in the news this week. Uh, Don Lemon, um, yeah. let go from CNN. Uh, any thoughts on that? Yeah, well, I can't really comment on it because I'm on the board of Warner Brothers Discovery. Um, but I will say that uh, I admire Don Lemon a lot. Um, and I know he'll end up somewhere um, uh, in a good position, uh, but I, I, I hated to see him go. Um, but it, it also brings back the issue of news and, you know, how we deliver it. And, you know, by 11 o'clock at night, I know everything that happened in the world. So when I watch morning shows, it's like, rehash stories but i still watch it you know because it gets me up in the morning um but the way we deliver news um has actually changed and i think one thing that tucker carlson and don lemon's stories uh or dismissals teach us is that no one's irreplaceable uh, and someone told me that a long time ago you know, don't over, don't ever be so comfortable in your job, mm -hmm. even if you're CEO, mm -hmm. um, that you think you're irreplaceable. Because yeah. if you do something wrong, or the, you know, the politics change or whatever, the power dynamics, yeah, all that stuff. right. You can be gone in a minute. So always, I tell young people this all the time: always have an outside profile, whether it's serving on boards, whether it's doing community work, don't put all your eggs into your um, your career because it can end at any time and you want to be able to pivot and do something else. Good full circle moment in this conversation. Right. It's Deborah Lee, a new memoir titled I Am Deborah Lee is out everywhere. Thank you so much for joining us here thank at you. Real Times Media. Great. Thank you both for having me and asking such great questions. Thank, thank you. you. Absolutely. I appreciate it's it. It's an honor. Yeah, thank you.